established these institutions, these landmarks, male and female, and marriage. And he, other, he established other ones. No other gods before me. Honor your father and your mother, just as an aside. There's a lot of people who say they're the most marginalized people in society. I'm more marginalized. You have the Oppression Olympics, right? <laughs> My group is more marginalized than you, so we're higher on the totem pole of oppression, right? There is nobody who is more marginalized in today's society than the elderly in long-term care homes. In some places in Canada, 40% of the people in long-term care homes have died because of COVID-19. Their children put them in there and forgot about them. And the state, you know, they put other, in, in, in New York, you saw what happened. They were putting sick people into the long-term care homes. And it wreaked just absolute havoc. But the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. And that is a landmark. The Bible says, you shall not covet. What does the progressive agenda say? I want what's yours. Mm -hmm. I want what you have. And I will take it from you by force. I will take it from you by changing the way that the government operates. And these are landmarks. Um, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is an ancient landmark for the good of society. It sets out that God created male and female. And you know, I, I had occasion to talk about God's creative power in the, in the context of these peacocks, going back to the peacocks. Uh, uh, these peacocks, uh, once a year, the males, had the, the males have these feathers that look like eyes. You've all seen them. Uh, and once a year it grows these really long feathers uh, for the purposes of the mating ritual and um, then it drops these feathers and they're all over the place in this in our neighborhood right so we, we go around and we pick them up and you take a look at that feather and it tells you that there's a creator it tells you that there is a God who designed and created and brought order to this world. Look at the eye on a peacock's feather. God replicates that through the through little tiny strands of DNA, and He does it over and over and over, thousands and millions of times because it's designed that way. And when Charles Darwin saw that eye, he said, "This thing makes me sick. <laughs> it makes me sick because it tells me there's a problem." With theory. How in the world could the eye of a peacock feather just evolve? It's an impossibility. Amen. And so, um, the Sabbath talks about the Creator. It says that there's a God who created you, and who loves you, and who set aside a day for you and Him for rest and for recreation. And the Sabbath is under attack, and it will be under greater attack in the days ahead. You see how, again, this, the, the progressive agenda uh, is, is, uh, is, is growing globally to change the Sabbath to Sunday and to have everybody worship on that day. Now, for whatever reason, as I was thought, thinking about what I was going to preach about today, I started thinking about the 1260 year period of the church in the wilderness. And we know that that period begins at 538 AD and it ran to 1798 AD. And the, the period of that time set out uh, in Daniel and in Revelation regarding the church in the wilderness. Because the church fled into the wilderness and the dragon was angry with the church and he went after the church to make war with the remnant of the seed. And that 1260 year period was fraught with persecution and darkness and superstition and backwardness where the word of God was chained up in monasteries and where people didn't read it and you had the authority of the Pope and the word of the Pope is God on earth.
But that period of time was also a time of the preservation of the, of the, of the faith. You had people who preserved the Word of God, and they faithfully copied it out, and they distributed it to the population, and it was a blessing to the people who received it. And when the time was right, the gospel and the reading of the Word of God brought, let there be light. And you had Huss and Jerome, and you had Luther and Melanchthon and the Reformation. And this, the contrast between light and darkness was so great because there had been darkness for so long. Without that period of darkness, the light would not have been as bright. And so the world could see the difference between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And it made an enormous impact. The Reformation did. And the gospel spread like wildfire because it was light in darkness. Without the gospel, there would be no reformation. But without the reformation, there would be no renaissance. And so, you had the reformers, and this, this light that began to shine. And it, there was corresponding light in the world of music, and architecture, and the study of the Word of God. And without the Reformation, you would not have had the Industrial Revolution, which was built on the light that came from the Reformation. And the study of celestial bodies, for example, Galileo. Galileo began to look at the universe and say, the earth moves around the sun. I can see that that's the case. And I can see that the earth is round. You can tell by looking at the horizon. And he published this work, and the, and the Pope said, you are going to recant of this heresy that the earth moves around the sun. Everybody knows that the, earth, the sun moves around the earth. It's a very egocentric position to take, <laughs> unsurprisingly for the papacy. The sun moves around me, not me around the sun. And so Galileo was forced in this, this show trial to say, uh, you know, the, the, the church had said, you have to say it doesn't move. And so finally Galileo says, fine, the earth doesn't move. And then under his breath he's rumored to have said, but yet it moves. <laughs> and he was imprisoned for seven years in his house because of his findings scientifically. And without the Industrial Revolution, you would never have had the Revolutionary War in America because it gave the strength to break free from the British yoke. Now, let's back up though a little bit. I'm going to tell you a story about how the Protestant Reformation spread in Europe. You know that the Protestant Reformation spread in Germany and into Switzerland, right? You've heard of William Tyndale. William Tyndale had a dream that he was going to translate the Bible into the English language. But even before William Tyndale, you had the Reformation come to France. And you had a Protestant group of people called Huguenots. How many of you have heard of the Huguenots? Is there anybody here who has Huguenot blood? I actually don't. I'm Scottish. Uh, Scottish, German, uh, and, uh, and Ukrainian, I think. Slavic. Uh, but uh, the Huguenot people in France, 90% of the country was Catholic, but when the Reformation came to France, when the Gospel came to France, the Huguenot, the Huguenot religion, that, that Protestantism, it began to rise because it was light and darkness. And it increased and it increased and it increased until some of the best princes and some of the best merchants and some of the best inventors and some of the best people in the land 
were Huguenots, they were Protestants. And the Catholic Church said, and the princes of the realm said, we're afraid of these people. We don't like these people. They're threatening the established order. And a decision was made in 1572 to massacre the Huguenots. And so during a wedding, many Huguenots had gathered. There was a big feast. There was, a prop, there was, there was peace in the realm. There was religious freedom. And in one day, the Catholic Church came and it killed somewhere between depending on what records you look at. You look at Huguenot websites and this is 70,000 people. 70,000 people in that short period of time in 1572. And the, apparently the blood ran down the streets and there were bodies in the, in the rivers and in the canals. And it's just this enormous massacre. And Pope Gregory XIII said, this is fantastic. What a blessed occasion. Let's commemorate this by striking, striking a coin to commemorate the massacre at St. Bartholomew's. And he sent that coin, that, med that medallion, to, uh, to a lot of different people who were his favorite people, commemorating the destruction of the Protestants. But an amazing thing happened. At that point in time, the French country was at the height of power, had the best navy in the world. There was tremendous light that was shining. And when uh, there's a book written about um, Paul Revere and the times that he lived in, and the author says, France opened the best of her veins when it did that. And the blood came gushing out. And wherever it went, it was like a sea that was a blessing to the rest of Europe. Because the Huguenot people, they fled from France. They went to Switzerland, they went to Germany, and they went to the United Kingdom. They went to England. And an interesting thing happened. Because of the massacre and the persecution of the Huguenots over the course of the next 150, almost 200 years, the best and the brightest of France dispersed throughout Europe. And there was a brain drain in France that the country has never recovered from today. Before France had the best navy, within a short period of time, England had the best navy. Before France had the best merchants, now England had the best merchants, and, and Switzerland, and Belgium. And many, many of those Huguenots came where? Here. Irony DuPont was a Huguenot immigrant to the United States, and he brought his study and his making of gunpowder to the Americans. And you've heard of DuPont Chemical. DuPont Chemical comes from the Huguenots, because DuPont was Huguenot. And you've heard of the Rockefellers and the Wright brothers. And Walmart, Walmart is founded by a Huguenot descendant. And uh, Paul Revere, Revoir, Apollo Revoir, was a Huguen of Huguenot descent. And Davy Crockett is of Huguenot descent. Now let's see, who else? Winston Churchill. Warren Buffett, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington. The last Huguenot church in the United States which still worships is in South Carolina and dates to 1844. And apparently you can go and worship there. So, you have this incredible light which came to America from Protestantism. And 
Now who has the world's best name? The United States does. Now, the Bible says that the, the church will be in the wilderness for a period of 1260 years. And I want to tell you something, that while the church was in the wilderness, there was comparative safety to the church. And in the Bible, whenever you see that somebody is in the wilderness, it is always in preparation for war. Always. When Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, it was in preparation, not just into the, the, the promised land, but it was in preparation to make war in order to enter the promised land. And when Moses was in the wilderness with God for 40 years with his sheep, this is before he went to Pharaoh, it was in preparation for a, a conflict, a crisis. It was in preparation for the exodus. Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years. And let me tell you, when God gave him the word to go speak to Pharaoh, the word that was spoken was offensive. I was talking to a student this week. He was told by his university, he said, well, I thought I had freedom of speech. And the university said, you have freedom of speech as long as you don't offend anybody. <laughs> the message that Moses was given for Egypt was offensive. It was offensive to Pharaoh. And the preparation for Moses' next 40 years of life was from his 40 years of herding sheep. Moses learned to be a caretaker and a, a, a shepherd. He, he learned to be gentle and meek. He learned to be long-suffering. He learned all of these things in the wilderness and in preparation for a time of crisis. That's not the only time that the wilderness preparation is mentioned in the Bible. David was in the wilderness before he, the crisis with Goliath. And we see that the time in the wilderness is preparatory, the time in the wilderness with God is preparatory to the crisis, to the conflict. Because when the conflict comes, it's too late to get ready. Amen. If David had been faced with Goliath and he was not ready because he was close with the Lord his God, with the living God, he would have faltered. He would have never even considered going to face Goliath. David in the wilderness was preparing for the crisis. Elijah in the wilderness was preparing for the crisis with Ahab and the prophets of Baal. John the Baptist was in the wilderness before he came to speak in Israel. Jesus was in the wilderness before he came to preach to the people. Even Paul, it says that after the road to Damascus experience, Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 25, that he immediately went into Arabia and he was there for three years. Little is written about this time in Paul's life. But in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25, it says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. And so, the message that I have for you today is that the church needs to lock itself in with God. Amen. We are in need of a wilderness experience today. We are personally. I am personally. You are personally. Because the crisis is coming. Moses was prepared to stand because he learned to trust in the living God. 
he learned to rely on the living God. And I love that section in Patriarchs and Prophets where Mrs. White says that al alone in the mountains with God, surrounded by the bulwarks of the everlasting hills, Moses forgot about the fashion and grandeur and architecture and splendor of the heathen religion that he had left. And that heathen nation because there is nothing that compares with being alone with God in the wilderness. Amen. It's not just about learning how small you are, but it's also learning about how big God is. That's right. And it's learning to love God and to walk with Him and to rely on Him. There's none of the people who I've mentioned, surely, who would have done the things that they had done. Look at the, our, the example of our Savior, the Lord God Himself in Jesus Christ. He went to the wilderness and spent time with His Father to strengthen Himself for the crisis and the conflict ahead. His life was a life of daily conflict with the powers of darkness. And so, the the thing that the church needs today is to go back into the wilderness and lock ourselves in with the Lord and shut off every distraction. Shut off the TV. Shut off the internet as much as possible. <laughs> put, down, put down the distractions and look at the Lord and follow Him and, and get ready because Surely, surely, the time of crisis is before us. Amen. I don't think that there's any doubt about it. And in order for us to be ready, that's what we need to do. Amen. It's time to close again.